We listen for a voice on the edge of hearing. We look for a vision that's just out of sight. In the wonders of creation, in the echoes of the beginning of the universe, and the quiet, in the roar, a mystery woven into all of heaven and all of earth, reaching out for something we can't touch. Our God is. Welcome to Unite Community Church. Today is Sexy Sunday. Uh, if you are watching this at a later date, you're like, what the heck is that? Um, well, Easter, we launched a campaign called Sexy. Um, and what we're doing is we're connecting with some local uh, homeless shelters to give them socks. Um, it's something that they desperately need. Oftentimes, we don't think to donate those things to them. Um, and, but I'm telling you, the reason we named our church Unite Community Church is because we believe that there are needs in our community. We believe there are people, businesses, uh, nonprofits that are working ridiculously hard to meet people's needs. And what we want to do is come underneath them and say, hey, what do you need? And we're going to give it to you. And so socks is where it's at. And so uh, we're, we've been asking you guys all week long, give socks, give socks, give socks. Um, follow us on social media. We're going to add up all the pairs of socks. I'm hoping not hundreds, but thousands upon thousands upon thousands of socks where we go bless the socks off these places that need something so dearly. And so with that, with that, we're going to jump into where we're going today. All right. We're in this sermon series called Visibly Invisible. And what we're doing in this series is that we're admitting, look, God, he's invisible. Okay. And that can kind of be weird unless you actually have felt God. Right? You believe in God so much so that he has revealed himself to you and he has essentially become visibly indivisible. Right? Really, that is how the Bible talks about our relationship with God is that he's supposed to be so real to us that to the world looking on, friends, family, they could see Jesus in us. And so what we're doing is we're just walking through the book of Colossians together, just verse by verse, and we're just going to kind of teach through it. And so what I'm going to ask is for you to kind of follow along with a little illustration with me today, okay? Because what I want to talk to you about today, last week we talked, week one, how Jesus becomes visibly invisible, and then we went through the real gospel, the real gospel. Now today, what I want to kind of challenge you with or lead you into is that the Christian life is the easy life. It really is. It's like this. It's like this. I don't know how you grew up, but I grew up with washcloths. Now, now, hang tight. You're going to go wash rag. Uh, you'll be like my grandma. My grandma would be like, I'd be in the shower. She'd be like, do you need a washcloth? You know, she, I don't know why she called it wash, wash, you know. Um, but for me, here's what was always funny about this. Is washcloths my whole life have never made any sense. Okay, let me kind of explain why. Because what happens, right? You get the washcloth wet, right? Okay, let me try to not make this huge mess. Okay, but you get it wet. All right, and then you apply the soap. Okay, as you apply the soap, you rub it in, you rub it, you rub it, you rub it. And I don't know if you can see this, but as you rub, it suds. As you rub, it suds. And then you take the wash cloth, thank you, Grandma, and you rub it all over your body, right? And then what happens? Well, you run out of soap. It doesn't really bubble, it doesn't really sud. And so literally what happened to me is it got to a point where Grandma would be like, you need a washcloth. And I'd be like, no. And she's like, well, how are you going to wash yourself? And I'm like, with my hands. Because do you see this? They're, they're like, you might think they're soap, but to get that to, like, you got to rub and rub and work really, 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 really hard to get that thing to bubble up. And that was my whole point. So literally my whole life was, you know what? I don't need a washcloth. Okay. In fact, I don't need any cloth. I will use my hands. I'll rub it on my body. And that's going to be the end of it. Right. And then... I got married. And what was funny about being married is that same thing, you know, like we're, we're planning how we're going to live in our house and we would buy, you know, we do the registration thing and we'd register for towels and we do hand towels. And then it got to, well, the washcloths, you know what I mean? And I was like, babe, babe, we don't need those. 
And she was like, why? And I'm like, because washcloths are pointless, right? Like you scrub and scrub, rub-a-dub-dub, and there is nothing happening in this baby. And all you're doing is on repeat, put more soap, scrubbing, more soap, scrubbing, right? And then if you get enough soap, guess what? You keep scrubbing, right? And so I'm like, I don't need any washcloths. And then we walked over and my wife introduced me to this, which is a loofah. Now, hang on, hang on, hang on, because I, as she introduced this, I was like, look, I ain't using that chick thing. You know, because first of all, like, I don't, like, just for me, okay, I don't spend a lot of time shopping in the personal care product sections. Okay, I get my deodorant, I barely shave, and so I don't even need shaving cream, I just get bar of soap, okay, and I'm like, plain Jane, give me just whatever, okay? But what was fascinating is that if you take a loofah, I just want you to see the difference. You get this wet just like the other thing. Put one drop of soap in here. Now here's what's fascinating. You just rub, all right? And here's what's awesome, okay? As you're seeing, I don't know if you can see this. See the bubbles, right? There's just bubbles. There's more bubbles. Like I'm not working it. Look at this. Look at the bubbles. Oh my gosh, look at this. Have you ever seen a washcloth do this? No, no, look at this. Look, at, I'm just, ooh, it's just oozing. It's just oozing out the bubbles. I mean, it's just going, and this will go for days. For days, like if you don't wash a loofah good, okay, men, men, if you've never seen one of these, or ladies, ladies, okay, but literally, you you have to thoroughly wash a loofah because these things hold the soap. These things, it's like you can't quite control it. Like now, 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 here's the question, right? Why are we talking about this wonderful loofah inside of this sermon, right? Right? And it's because I think this is what Jesus had in mind. Okay, let me kind of wash this. You know what, here's, here's the funnier part of the illustration. I'm gonna take my soapy washcloth and wipe the soap off of my hands. Point is, right, why are we talking about this in church, right? Well, it's because I think what happens oftentimes, okay, is that when you come into a relationship with God, okay, what I think he had in mind for us was seriously to be a loofah with his love in our faith, right? Like, think about this, right? What I think God had in mind is like those moments, right, when someone cuts you off, you know what I mean? And you and you just ooze, ooze, you got the loot, you just ooze the love of God out of your life, you know, where you give them the benefit of the doubt, right? You look at them, you're like, oh, I'm sure someone's maybe injured, they're probably in a hurry, they gotta get to work, you know what? You know what, God, I know they cut me off, but dear Lord, bless their soul, I'm sure they have something really, really important to do. I am just oozing the love and the forgiveness of Jesus in my life, right? Or, or, or you go get on the plane and you got the red eye. You know what I mean? You're sitting next to Chatty Cathy. You know what I'm talking about? Where like you got the red eye for a reason. You want to take and go to sleep, right? She took the caffeine pills and won't shut up, right? But, but because, because you're going to ooze like a loofah, the love of Jesus out of you, right? Right? What happens is you listen to Chatty Cathy. You hear her story. Oh my gosh, because you're oozing the love of Jesus out of your life because you're a believer, right? And this is what we do. What happens? Oh man, you get to pray with her. Oh, you get to lead her to the Lord. In fact, she lives in your city. She lives in your town. You invite her to UCC. Dude, she's getting baptized. Look, Thank you, Lord, for not getting frustrated with Chatty Cathy, even though you wanted to go to sleep, because now, now, she is getting baptized by you. No, no, none of those scenarios ever happen, right? Like maybe it's just me, but what I find what I'm doing in my life is not so much oozing Jesus. Okay, go back to the dish rag. I mean, I'm like scrubbing, scrubbing, scrubbing really, really hard to produce anything good, right? Because I'm getting cut off, and what do I do? Oh, I'm sure blessed them in the, no! No, I'm ripping her head in front of them and I'm going to cut them off and then brake check them and then slow them down and maybe even ram my car into them, right? Because you know who I am? Right, Chatty Cathy. Look, look, as she's like, da, 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 da. look, I don't, uh-huh, uh-huh, put my ear pods in. I don't care, right? Don't, and the problem with that, go back to the little funny illustration. You got loofah, washcloth, loofah, washcloth. Here's what I would suggest. If you're finding yourself more like a washcloth where you're having to work really, really, really hard, scrub really, really, really hard, dig really, really, really deep to produce anything godly, then here's what I would say. You probably haven't met Jesus and really understood grace. That's what I would say. In fact, in fact, I would argue you're probably doing it wrong, right? 
Or again, Jesus said something. I just want to read you what Jesus said. Okay, and we're going to use this to springboard where Jesus said this in Matthew 11, verse 28. He says, come to me, all who are weary. Another version of the text says, come to me, all who are laboring. Right? Worrying about life. Laboring, right? Right? And burden. And watch this. I will give you rest. What Jesus is trying to set up is that you and I are supposed to be this loofah where we're finding so much peace, so much rest, that even though the world is beating us down, we're worried, we're heavy laden. Listen, when you come to Jesus, listen to me, it should be a rest where his spirit, his love bubbles out of us like a loofah. Now, again, where do we get that from? Well, insert the book of Colossians. Remember, like I told you, we're just going to walk through this book of the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter for the next several weeks, right? And last week, if you heard or you were here, we talked about week one, Paul wanted to establish what we believe in, which is the real gospel or, or the good news of Jesus, right? Which we define, what is that? What do we believe in? We believe that when you come into a relationship with Jesus, right, you receive grace, that produces peace by Christ and Christ alone, right? That's where we worship last week. Man, we celebrated last week. We said that's what Easter is all about is Jesus plus nothing else gives you the peace that you're looking for in this life. And it's on the heels of that, that Paul in verse three writes to you and me. And he says this, we always thank God, our father, our Lord, Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Now hang tight, okay? But what Paul is saying, okay, remember, the book of Colossians was written to the church or the people, the Christians, the believers in the city of Colossae. Okay, so what Paul is saying, he's, he's going, hey, we think of you. We thank God for you. We're praying for you. We're celebrating over you. Paul's going, when I hear about you, right, I'm celebrating. Why, why, why? Because we have heard of your faith. Time out. Paul is celebrating over their faith, what? In Jesus Christ and of the love you have for all the saints. Okay. The faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. Now time out because what does it look like to be a Christian? Right? Like you might go, hey, what's going to be a lifestyle that makes God celebrate over me? Right? Or, or going to make Christians pray for me and celebrate over me? Well, it's very simple. Paul boils it down. You're going to have faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus. What's that mean? It means that you believe Jesus did live. He is God's son. He came and lived a perfect, sinless life. He laid his life down to sacrifice for you and me. And he did not stay dead, but he rose back to life. We have faith in that Jesus that he's living and active. And when we come into a relationship with him, look at his spirit oozes out of us. Okay. That is the faith or in short, what's oozing out of us is that we love God, love God, and then also love people. All right. And so what Paul is saying, he's going, yo, 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 I am so thankful that when I hear of you, we're not getting lost. And all these other things, oh, no, man, you are loving God. You are loving people. So much so, keep reading, all over the world, this gospel, the good news about Jesus, right, is bearing fruit and growing, just as it's been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and all its truth. Go back to last week. God's grace, as soon as you understand what God wants for you is not to crush you, but to lift you up, give you something better. He wants to become powerful even in your powerless situations, right? He goes this, you've learned it from Epaphras. This was the church planter. He was the guy that started this movement. Our dear fellow, fellow servant who was a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the spirit. Now time out because I want you to get a picture of what's happening. Okay, because what's happening in this church is, gosh, is my prayer for ours. Like last week, if you were at one of our Easter services, man, it was explosive. It was exciting. 
It was like Easter is one of those moments in, in American church, right, that, that people wake up and decide, I'm going to go to church. And whose church do they decide to come to? What was so exhilarating, what was so exciting was it was ours. Look, our, our church like quadrupled in one week. I mean, it was electric. It was awesome. But don't miss this. The reason people responded to your invitation, the reason people decided, you know what, I'm going to come. Maybe, maybe you're coming back again today, right? Right? Like you're, you're like, hey, I'm going to watch again. I'm going to come back again. The reason that's happening, don't miss this, is because they see the invisible God in you and in me. And how they see it is our outworkings of our love into the community. And man, that's the dream. And what Paul's saying, man, I thank God that this gospel, the good news of Jews, is so rooted in you, right? That it is not staying in these walls, but it's going beyond. It's going to the ends of the earth. Like literally, it's hitting our towns, our communities, our families, our workplaces. So much so that when people decide, all right, I'm, I'm going to give God a shot. Where do they go? To a place that they go, I want to be like them because I see Jesus in them. Understand, that's the goal. What I want to see in our church is more. Don't miss this. More, 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 and more people discovering and loving Jesus and going out into the community to love it so much so that it shines with the brilliance of Jesus. That's what I want. But here's what's fascinating. That's not an original thought. In fact, generally speaking, every church before us has always wanted that. The issue is they've kind of gone about it the wrong ways, right? Like, for example, I don't know what you grew up in, but I remember there was one point when I was young being a young pastor. I was a college pastor before I was doing what I'm doing now. Okay, and I remember being out to eat with Apple, at Applebee's. Okay, that's what we did. You know, we do a half-off appetizer, and there's like 10, 12 years ago. Um, you know, and, and so at almost, almost every Friday night, we were at Applebee's having a half-off appetizers, right? And one day in particular, we're like jacked up on like some Jesus juice or something. I don't really know what was going on there, but, but people were like really, really excited about like things are going positive in their life. I, I don't know what it was, but one very ambitious, very excited young dude was like, you know what, let us pray. Now, naturally, there's about 15, 20 of us gathered at a big, long table. Okay, we're not the quietest bunch you could imagine, okay? So, but bottom line is we're like, oh, let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. And then this dude stands up. I'm not making this. Stands up and starts to say, our Heavenly Father, we just want you to know that you alone are God and all these other. And I mean, he just started to yell. To which at that point in the middle of prayer, and I'm the pastor, remember, okay? I just got up and left. Left. I was like, I don't want no part of that. I don't want no part of that. Like, what is it? What are you, what are you doing, right? Like, sh sit down. Sit down, right? Because because oftentimes, right, we hear these things. Man, the, God, the good news has to spread. Therefore, let's just scream and shout. And hopefully, the world will then discover and love with Jesus is right right and, and maybe maybe you don't believe that story but other things that you have seen in our community i was at the ann arbor art fair there was there a guy up on the milk crate with the bullhorn screaming about hell okay like again again i i, I don't know if he's there this year okay we're, we're post covid now but pre-covid man that dude was there every week and i just i'd walk up and i'm gonna say man you, 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 could you i'm not sure jesus would do that you know like i'm glad you're up on your soapbox but let's just you know you know or 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 what about the door knocking you know, like I've heard horror stories, like taking kids out, you know, we teach them. Okay, look, we're going to go spread the good news of Jesus. We're going to knock on doors. They knock on the door and they teach little kids. Knock on the door. Hey, what, what is your name? Okay, Betty. Betty, I'm, 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 I'm Chris. Man, I'm really happy you're here. But if you were to die today, do you know if you were to go to an eternal damnation called a place called hell or heaven? Again, again, I, all I'm saying, <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm walking the streets with those people, I'm out. I'm out because, because the bottom line is I don't think that's what people need. Now, again, I'm all about promoting the church. And again, again, I'm all about, like our church has bought billboards, okay? We pass out flyers. We have invite cards. I'm all about brand recognition. I'm all about that. But the bottom line is above and beyond all of that, 
What our lives are supposed to do, what really makes an impact is our lives reflecting the faith that we have in Jesus that produces a love for people even in the most destitute situations. You know what it looks like? It looks like when we're at the grocery store, you know, and, and, and we're not, we see someone and maybe you notice, you know what, you know, they're sheepishly grabbing something off the shelf and you know what you do? You purposely get in front of them. You know what you purposely do? You purposely hand your credit card to the lady checking them out and say, you pay for everything for them because I want to bless them. And you just tell them God loves them. That's what it looks like. You know what it looks like? I think it looks like when you see someone in your school, in your workplace, and they're emotional and they're acting out of sorts, you know? Like, like you know, th- th- this isn't normal, right? You know what it is? It's taking time to take them out to lunch. And you know what? You pay for them. And you just say, are you okay? Can I, dare I say, pray for you? Not at you, not convert you, but just be with them. You know what it is? It's like if you're on a sports team. You know, your kids are on a sports team and you're watching a family go through a divorce. You know what it is? It's you taking the time to say, hey, man, I care. What can I do to help? You know what it looks like? It looks like us being that loofah just bubbling out. The problem is, is I feel like oftentimes, instead of just allowing God to bubble out of our hearts, we're doing the really, 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 really work hard. And I think the reason why is because we're missing what drives our faith. Again, what I love about the Bible and what I love about this series is that we're just going to teach the Bible, right? Because if you slow down and just kind of take this thing verse by verse, man, it is not a hidden code to be cracked. It is plain as day. And what Paul is saying is there's this church that's so effective that what they're seeing on a micro scale is happening on a macro scale and going worldwide. Right? And what Paul is saying is that it is this faith in Jesus that's producing this life, love like a loofah, and it's just exploding out of all the Christians. And you and I are on the backside going, okay, well, how do we do that? Right? We'll come back. Come back to text. It says this. Remember, just reread it. Verse 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints. Okay, so love God, love people. We thank God this is happening. But then Paul states how this happens where he says this, the faith and love, remember it's faith in Jesus that makes us love people, watch this, that spring. Okay, you want to know what produces our faith and love, the loofah, right? What gets everything going where we don't have to work really, 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 really hard? Here's what he says. He says it springs from the Hope. Time out. The what? The hope. I want you to say that with me. I know we're on camera. You might be in a coffee shop, but just scream this out at the top of your lungs. It'll be funny. Everyone will look at you. Okay? But it springs from the what? The hope. Hope that is in the word of truth. And what's truth? The gospel that has come to you. Now keep going. All over the world, this truth, the gospel, is bearing fruit and growing just as been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood, watch this, God's grace. What's the gospel? It's God's grace that produces a peace through Christ and Christ alone, right? It's God's grace in all its truth. Do you see it? Do you see it? What, what Paul is saying, okay, is that how we go hit the streets, how we go make Jesus known, okay? It's not that it's force. It's not a wash rag, like, I got to be a really, really good person. Argh. No, no, no. He's saying this is a natural, bubbling, overflowing thing that rips out of us and that comes out of us through this thing called hope. Hope that is in Jesus. Now, time out, because, because again, when we hear hope, again, we're, I'm not sure we understand what Paul is meaning. See, again, I don't know how you hear hope, but oftentimes when we hear hope, we think blind optimism, right? Like, like think of this, like use hope in a sentence, you know, like you'll buy tickets to a game or a concert and we're like, oh, I hope it's good, right? Like, like you don't do any research. You don't really know. You just, you just, I I paid money. I hope because I paid money because it's in a state. I hope it's good. It's blind optimism optimism, right? Get my sports fans in here. Where are my Lions fans at, right? Like, right? Like we, we hope the Lions are going to be better next year. Okay. Here's the problem with that. Okay. That's blind 
optimism, okay? That's not hope, okay? Because the reality is, is that that's ignoring the facts. The reality is the Lions, they haven't signed anyone. The reality is the Lions haven't won a playoff game in forever, okay? The Lions have not ever won an NFL Super Bowl. They have not ever been good. They have a culture problem. They haven't signed anyone good. And if they don't figure out how to get a QB, oh, if we just had a QB that was a Super Bowl champ, oh, wait, we did, still didn't win. Okay, so therefore we hope, we hope. Look, do you see it? Sorry, the Lions are kind of my soapbox, but, but, but do you see it? It's blind faith. It's, it's hoping without reasoning. And what Paul is saying is he's going, that's not us. He's saying, look, for us that are believers, as this world spins in both good and bad directions, we don't have blind optimism, although we do have the Christian pithy phrases, right? Like we have the phrases that when life is going down, when it's the fertilizer's hitting the fan, you know? You know those moments. It's when the ship is sinking. It's when you got the box put on your desk at work. It's when you've made the poor choice, your family goes out the window. It's when you've drank too much. It's when you've made those bad choices. It's in those moments that when you are saying sorry, trying to put your life back together, here comes the well-meaning Christian to go, you know what, you just gotta have faith. Just let go and let God, let Jesus take the wheel. And, and look, if, if you ever walk up to me and say that, I'm going to throat punch you. Okay? Wham! Okay? Because, although I, I think you mean well, bottom line is, is that's blind. i got to have faith. Faith in what? And that's what Paul is coming back to. He's going, look at, look at, look at. We as Christians, we don't have blind optimism. We have a hope in the real good news of Jesus. And don't miss this. These guys understood what this meant. See, again, one of the disconnects for us when we read the Bible is like we're 2,000 years removed, right? Understand, for the Colossians, they knew about Jesus so much so it was like, yeah, in my lifetime, that guy did miracles. Oh, yeah, Aunt Betty, oh, she was in Jerusalem. Oh, she saw the blind guy see again. You know, like, like that was what was happening. See, Colossians, this church was birthed about 20 to 30 years after Jesus' death. So think of this. It wasn't 2,000 years removed. They knew, they knew there was this man named Jesus. They knew he was doing miracle after miracle after miracle, defying all odds, that it was so obvious it couldn't be rumors. Do you understand that? And then they knew, they knew Rome killed him. They knew he was dead as a doornail. They saw what Jesus had come back to life. And don't miss that. That is what they were hope was in. Because if Jesus could do that, then here's the million dollar question. What can he do in your life, no matter which way life is tending you? Do you see that? See, that is the easy life. That's what oozes out of us. Because here's what I've learned about life. Okay, maybe this is just me, but here's what I've learned. Because that in life, you're either in a storm or you're walking into a storm. You know what I mean? Like, like life, life is not perfect. Life is not pretty. And what do you and I need as we interact with people that we love and care about? What do we and you need as we look to Jesus and say, what do we need? What do we need? We need hope. Hope in what? <laughs> that Jesus can take dead things and bring them back to life. We need hope in the gospel. Hope in heaven. That we weren't built for this earth. We were built for something more, something greater than that relationship with God. And I think, I think, if you come back to Jesus now, that's why he invited us when he said, hey, come to me, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. See, folks, hope, that hope in heaven, hope that Jesus takes dead things and brings it back to life. Look, it is not blind optimism. It is saying, look, if you could do it then, you could do it now. If you can do it then, you can do it now. And that's my hope. That's my prayer. Okay, as your pastor, as your leader, that we can land there. And so to wrap up, here's what we're going to do. Is I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to choose hope today what I want. I want you to claim hope over your life. Okay? Because here's what I know. Is that in this life, like I said, storms are coming. 
Storms are going. It's going to happen. Okay? And there are people right now that you're watching and you need some hope in some pretty hopeless situations. You didn't know it's going to be okay. There's other people that you're like, well, my life's fine. And, and here's the deal. Put this message in your back pocket and come back to it. Because again, 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 our hope in this Jesus is what oozes out our love for people. And so here's what I want to do is I just want to walk us through some things. Some things that maybe you're hurting with or maybe things you're struggling with or maybe things you need to be thankful for. But here's what I'm going to do. I want to claim hope over those situations. Right? Scripture teaches us that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Right? And we grow in our faith. And today, here's what I want. I want us to lock into the hope of Jesus that springs us into all that God has for us. So if you're by your heads, here's what I want to pray. I'm going to pray for the first type of person. Maybe you're here and you're going, you know what, people, they've hurt me. If that's you, listen to me, I just want to pray for you. And I want you to look to Jesus for hope. Okay, and I want you to bow your heads and pray, God, I pray for the person that's watching. God, that they would find hope inside of the hurt. God, what I mean by that, that we would stare right into your eyes, God, on the cross. Is that our hope is not on the people of this earth, but it's on you, Jesus. Jesus, that you came and you died and laid it down for us. And Jesus, just like you took your life up, God, I pray that for these people that have hurt this person, God, I pray that they would find in their hearts ways to forgive them, that they would find ways in their life to heal from those kinds of things. I pray that, that they would really come to you, come to you as you said, Jesus, and you will give us rest. God, I pray for that. God, for others in the room, God, that they're looking on and for them, maybe their, their hopelessness comes from life and going, man, life's just not fair. You know, life is hurting. Maybe it's uh, the fact they can't have kids. And they're going, God, it's just not fair. I'm doing the right things. And man, that's just not loofah. Man, I get it. It's just I'm not there. And if you would bow your heads, I want to pray for you. God, I pray for those in the room that are watching that you would do your great work and put your hope in them. God, I know on this side of eternity, life is not fair. Like I said, God, we're either in a storm or we're walking to a storm. And so, God, I pray that our hope would be in you, Jesus, that you are the author and the perfecter of this life. And Jesus, as you were in agony on the cross, you even looked your eyes up to God, saying, why have you forsaken me? Saying, God, this isn't fair. Jesus, you still laid it down. You still finished the good work. You picked your life back up. And now you're able, you're able to put your spirit in us. And God, I pray that our hope would be in you and that Jesus, hey, we believe you took your life back up. We believe we're going to heaven. And so God, I pray that you bring comfort, comfort to people that are just feeling worn out by life. Um, the next group of people I like to pray for, maybe you're here and you're really struggling, like you don't know how you're even gonna pay your bills. And that's a hard place to live, man. I, I, it's hard. But here's what I know. You submit your lives to Jesus. He said, come to me, come to me. I'll give you rest for your soul, rest for your heart. He's going to move you, move you to a place where he wants you to be. And listen, I'm not saying that we're going to pray and all of a sudden your finances are going to fall into place. But here's what I know is that you're going to be able to find peace and rest. And we're going to pray his hope over your life. And so again, for people that feel like they can't make it financially, God, I pray that there would be a hope in their heart. God, a hope for tomorrow. God, as inflation goes up, gas goes up, groceries are going up. God, I pray, I pray that we know, we know that you're our heavenly father and that you're going to provide for us all that we need. And so Jesus, our hope is in the fact that we might not see a way out, but Jesus, you took your life back up. God, give us that hope. We're betting on that, that your gospel, your good news 
is our foundation for your activity in our life. And just like you're living and active now, God, be living, be active in these people's lives. God, even in their finances. And then finally, the last group of people I feel to pray for. Well, those of you that feel overwhelmed and full of anxiety. Man, I know you might feel like you can't get on your, out of your own mind. And to wrap up, here's the deal. I want to read to you one last text. It's a guy named Jeremiah. He was called the weeping prophet. And he had a hope. And he was able to calm his mind through hope. Where scripture says this in Lamentations 3, he goes, I remember my affliction and my wandering and the bitterness and the gall. I remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Do you feel that? The overwhelmed, depressed, anxiety filled. He says, yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Hope. What's he called to mind? Watch this. Verse 22 or 24. The Lord is my portion says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Hope in him. Hope in him. Hope in him. Even when people suck, even when life's not fair, even when my bills can't seem to get out of my life, even when I'm anxious, overwhelmed, and depressed. He said, my hope, my hope is not in this blind optimism. No, no, no. We stare right into the cross and have the boldness to walk in His grace and in His power because we have hope. We have hope of what Jesus did on the cross He can do in our lives. And so God, I pray that we can rest in that, that we can abide in that. And God, wherever we're at on the map, God, that we would be able to say, God, our hope, our hope is in You, in You, Jesus and in the finished work of the cross, that if you can lift your life back up, God, you can do the same in ours. And so, God, I pray that today marks our day where we come before you, lay it all down before you and say, God, do something. Take dead things, bring them back to life. And God, in that, give us rest. Give us rest. Give us rest. So that as we go, as we move, we can bubble up with your thankfulness, to your worship, and who you are to go love people. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Listen, man, I love, love, love you guys. I love studying this book. It's super, super fun. Again, we're just going to kind of continue forward in this. Um, so if you maybe want to get ahead, you can keep reading in the book of Colossians. Like I said, we're just going to go verse by verse right through this thing. But here's the bottom line. I hope today, today you find some hope and you embed your hope in the empty tomb. I love you guys. We'll see you next week.